What's up, guys? Welcome to Running Things. My name's Riley. I'm your host. I'm also the editor over at TempoJournal.com. We have a massive episode for you today. It's a London Marathon special edition, and we are going to be chatting to Aussie marathoners Sinead Diver and Brett Robinson. Before we do that, though, today's pod was made possible by our friends at Nike Running and the Nike Run Club app City Challenge Series. If you've been training for a race that you now know won't happen, don't give up on it. You can complete the marathon your own way in the You Can't Stop London Challenge in the NRC app. It's 42 kilometers, just like our athletes in London are going to be doing, and you've got a whole week to do it. It starts today, and whether you decide to do it all in one go or spread it out over the week, please make sure you follow local government area restrictions. Rumor has it Brett and Sinead each have four pairs of shoes across the Nike Zoom Fast franchise, and yes, that includes the Alpha Fly. They're giving those away, so make sure you complete the challenge, share your achievement badge on socials, tag in Brett, tag in Sinead, and you could be a winner. Super exciting today to be joined by one of three Aussies heading over to London for the marathon. I'm talking about fifth place in last year's 2019 London Marathon, Sinead Diver. Sinead, thanks for joining us. No worries. How are you, really? I'm pretty well, pretty well. Now, Good. talk us through, first and foremost, when everybody's watching this, it will be Monday of race week. Um, how have the last couple of months gone for you? Are you happy with your training? Where's everything at? Yeah, it's been um, a really different training block um, just because of the whole um, situation with COVID. Um, so I stopped training with the group pretty much in March. And since then, it's mostly been solo. But um, recently, uh, I've been lucky enough to get Dave Ridley to help me out with my threshold sessions, which has been really, really good. Um, so, yeah, training has gone good. Um I think my I've I've got a full marathon training block in, but just before that, um, around the time I did the Steigen three k race, I had a bit of a, a niggle after that for a few weeks. So I was getting worried because it was getting close to when I needed to start marathon training. But thankfully, it came good, um, and since then, everything's been pretty good. Do you? I mean, if we if we go back to say New York last year, you had a you had a lot of racing coming into that. I mean, you had yeah. Gold Coast Half Marathon in July, and then you pretty much had a, a half marathon, you know, Sunshine Coast, one in the UK, and then you had obviously Doha, 10,000 meters as well. So you had a lot of racing sort of leading into to the back half of last year. Obviously, haven't had that this year. No. How do you, do, are you able to just sort of gauge where you're at through training, or do you really miss that racing to sort of test your fitness? Um, I do miss the racing, actually. So it'll be interesting to see if it makes much of a difference. Um, with this race coming up but generally I gauge my fitness through my threshold sessions um, I usually for the marathon I can tell usually where I'm at based off those um, but yeah it, is, it has been a lot different not having races because you always can I don't know take it a step further in a race um, so you build a lot of confidence if you race well and frequently up, come up to the race and also before New York, I had a stint at Altitude. So myself and Ellie were in Semeritz. Uh, so that was great. So I haven't had that either. But um, yeah, I guess we'll see what happens. <laughs> I still, I, yeah, I still feel fit though. And I'm very, I'm confident in my training this time around. It's just been a bit different. Now we've, uh, we've got some sort of training nerds who, who listen to the show is there, have you had any sort of key sessions, like have you had sort of key threshold sessions or key workouts that you've you've hit and you've sort of got a lot of confidence from or you've thought af afterwards, geez, wow, that went better than I thought. I must be really fit. Like is, is there anything that sort of stands out for you? Yeah, I think the last few weeks, um, especially since I've had some help from Dave um, with pacing for the threshold sessions, we've like, we've knocked out some really big sessions. Um, and there's one that Nick gets us to do every marathon build up. It's like almost 40k in uh, in total effort. <laughs> uh, so, and that one is always a good marker for me. So if I if I do that one well, I, it really builds my confidence. And yeah, it went well this time, so I'm happy with that. What's the uh, if if I had a session to do that was almost 40k? I mean. I think a couple of days in the lead up, I'd be, I'd be nervous and, uh, and unable <laughs> to sleep. What's the, how are you sort of like, how do you prepare yeah. for that? The, the day before, is it all good? Are you, are you sleeping well the night before a session like that? No, I actually slept really badly the night before that session. 
So, which is probably good because that's what I'm like before a race anyway. And also Dave starts, has to finish his sessions by 8.15. <laughs> so, so I had to get up at like 4.30 that morning <laughs> so that I could get an hour run in before I met Dave. And then we did the main session. Um, so that was, yeah, that was interesting. And I, it's been a long time since I gotten up that early. I know you do it all <laughs> the time, but it's really hard. <laughs> it's the best time of the day. now i want to ask a little bit about um you know you spoke about adapting to you you know you've been training on your own or you just had you know very small groups obviously you know all the way back to march but a lot of people you know you're different to a lot of professional runners in that you're working as well you've got a couple of young kids as well it's a lot to juggle especially in you know one when you're training to be a a top five or a top 10 marathoner in the world. And two, you know, when you're, when you're in the middle of whether it's 160, 200 Ks a week, how, uh, how chaotic has it been for you in the last few months? Has it been hard to kind of juggle everything that's, that's changing and going on? Yeah, it has been really hard. Like this has probably been one of the harder, uh, buildups I've had because of COVID because, um, the schools were closed as well. So, uh, we had, uh, homeschooling, which has been, bit of a nightmare <laughs> to be honest but having said that um I work in IT and usually I go into the office so I haven't been going into the office this time so I've actually gained a couple of hours back a day so that's really helped in training so I get training done in the morning and I don't actually start work till 11 so which is really good so I can do my training come home do some school work with the boys and then start work now in my opinion one of the most I don't know if underrated is the right word. I think that word gets thrown around a lot, but maybe one of the most underappreciated marathoners in, in the world. Seventh at London last year, fifth in New York on a on a really tough course. Um, have those did those results surprise yourself at all? And does it make it harder to sort of manage the expectations around your performances? Because we would look at you know seventh in London, fifth in New York, and we would think. Oh wow, she's I guess she'll come top five again this year or top seven or top ten. Like, is does it become hard to sort of manage that expectation? And do you have that expectation of yourself? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's definitely easier going into a race as the underdog and not having that expectation um over you. But and like when I went into London, I know Nick expected me to come top ten, but I certainly didn't. I was like, not. Nah. That's not going to happen. But then I came seventh um, and I'd uh, gone into New York. Um, I was more confident going into New York, I think, even though it was a course that didn't really suit me with all the hills and that. But um, I was training really well. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I I prefer to go in as the underdog without expectation. But uh, I do feel that expectation now for London this year. Um, but I'm not going to let it swamp my thoughts or anything. I'm just going to, you know, it's it's going to it's probably one of the strongest fields ever. Um, you know, it's I'm going to race as best I can, and I normally I don't usually worry so much about the placings. Um, I kind of have a time that I want to get and my own um, my own goals for the race, and then usually you know the placings just come. So if I have a good race, yeah, I'd like to place. And I mean, we think about your progression as well as being like, not, not just in times, but your progression on the world stage. I mean, um, October, 2018, you were, you were winning the Melbourne marathon, setting a course record. Fast forward, you know, fast forward two years, you're competing, you know, you're in one of the most stacked fields ever in a marathon, right? Like it's, uh, it's crazy to think how far you've come. Yeah, I guess I feel um, <laughs> I'm a bit time constrained <laughs> because I started so late. I feel like I have a lot to to achieve in a shorter amount of time. Um, so yeah, I'm. I guess I'm lucky in the opportunities that I've had. I'm lucky that Nick has been able to get me into those marathons. Like Melbourne Marathon really set me up like that time, you know, to get me into the major marathons. So um, yeah, that like that's been it's been. You know, it's been a whirlwind. It's been it's been really cool, though. Um, now let's let's jump into talking about 
race day and the race itself. It, obviously a very different London. We saw you led last year's London Marathon for the majority of the race, right? Um, yeah. This year, of course, we're talking about 19 laps of a, you know, two point something kilometer course, the little, little loop around St. James Park. Will that tactically, will that, will that change you going in with a set plan of how you'd like to run the race or will you just kind of, you know, like you did last year, see how it unfolds and sort of react accordingly? Yeah, I think you always have to be ready to just see how it unfolds and react because last year we had so many discussions about the pace groups and everyone was very particular and specific about what pace groups they wanted. And then we all got to the start line and then that just all went out the window, like straight away. Nobody adhere to anything um and I took off obviously and because I had the time that I wanted to get and then um I felt no I should really run with the pace group but once I did that for a few k I I realized it wasn't going to suit me because there's a lot of surging and then I was happy just to go do my own thing um this year I would rather run with a pace group it's definitely more beneficial and it's just easier with running in a group uh, but the pace groups, I'm kind of in between the planned pace, pace groups again this year. So uh, they often change though the day before the race. So I'm kind of hoping that maybe they'll go have a group that is more suited to the time that I'm aiming for. Um, if not, I'm just going to see what happens out there. Like I want to run with the pace group, but I'm not going to, um, I don't know ruin my race just to run with the pace group like i'm going all this way i'm gonna give it my best shot um mm. so i'll just have to decide once the race starts how to race it i guess do you um and i, I suppose you don't but do you when you get to the start line especially now having performed so well in london and performed you know even better in new york and, and against great fields as well like when you roll up to a start line and you're next to, you know, Bridget Cosguy, the world record holder, or Viv Chariot or, or any one of these other names, do you, what's the feeling like? Is it, is it, wow, I'm lining up next to the world record holder or, or is it just comfort now because you've been there, you're, you, you're now a much more experienced marathoner? Yeah, I, um, I'm not sure why I didn't get, um, <laughs> why I didn't fully realise that say lining up in London and New York, like I was totally comfortable with being there. I didn't feel out of my depth or anything. But then when I look back at photos, I'm like, oh wow, look, there's Cosguy and there's, you know, <laughs> uh, there's Des Linden. And, you know, I'm like amazed that I'm beside these, these ladies. But um, at the time, I'm just completely consumed by how the race is going to go. And I'm not really thinking about anybody else. Now we know, um, we know, for a lot of athletes and especially a lot of athletes in London uh, are going to be chasing the Olympic qualifier, right? Yep. Uh, you're, you're in the position, you've earned yourself the position where you're currently our fastest ranked marathoner. So you'll be in line for that number one spot. And we know a lot of other marathoners right now are, are either going to be chasing that time in London or they're looking for a race in early 2021 20, to try and hit the time you can kind of run without that pressure, right? Because you've, you, you're the fastest ranked. So it's going to, it's going to have to be a lot of people run quicker to, to sort of knock you out of that Tokyo position. Is it, um, is it a weight off your shoulders where you, you're really just running for position or, or for your own goals? You're not sort of locked into trying to have to hit that standard. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, there would be more pressure on me if I had to get an Olympic qualifier. Definitely. Um, but having said that, you know, I do have my own goals for this race. I've set another goal that I want to hit. And, um, you know, I'm t uh, taking a lot of risks going over, I guess. Um, it's not, I'm not taking it lightly and I'm not kind of going over just to, you know, participate in a race. I'm going to give it everything. I've worked really hard for it. Um it's probably not going to be that easy to get back into Australia afterwards. So there's a lot of risks associated with this race. So I'd be very disappointed if I, if I didn't get a, a PB. Um, but, you know, the, the thing with the marathon is you can be in really great shape. And then depending on, there's lots of different factors that can make it go wrong. So we'll see, see how it goes. Like ideally, if, if it's a good 
good weather and I'm feeling good, um, I definitely would like to go faster than I did uh, in London last year. Which was 224.11, I believe. Now, you just touched on something that I, I, I guess I want to make sure people kind of understand and appreciate, and that is the sacrifice that not just yourself, but Ali and, and Brett as well are going through to, to, to line up in London. It's, um, you know, it's, it's going to be a pretty tough. And of course, when people are watching this, it will be race week. So you'll, you'll be over in London, pretty isolated in your sort of hotel, hotel grounds for the week, not a lot of interaction with other athletes and, and probably a pretty lonely week. Um, you'll race. And then depending on when you can even get a flight back home. Of course, when you get back to Australia, you're going to have to go through another two weeks of of hotel quarantine, which for a runner is like, you know, it's probably everybody's worst nightmare. So it um it's a huge sacrifice that you guys you guys are making just to stand on a start line. Like on the one hand we're really lucky that we have this opportunity. And then on the other hand, there's been quite um a lot more stress um leading up to this this race just because of all the complexities and actually Nick has taken a lot of those on board for us and has organized you know so much for us and helped us out a lot but there's still you know I I'm anxious about been away from home for too long been away from the boys for too long um the cost the cost associated with having to get a business class flight back if that's what I need to do to get into the country and then there's the quarantine um so like if we were racing, if I was racing in Melbourne, I wouldn't have any of those worries in my head, <laughs> but I do. But having said that, it's, I could have, I could have not gone. I had the choice not to go to London and I still think it's worth it. And I definitely want to give it a shot. So I'm like really excited to go. I can't, I can't imagine that when you were sort of given the option of, do you want to run London or not? I, I can't imagine a world where you would have ever said, uh, no, I don't want to, I don't want to take this no, opportunity. No way. I actually, I really didn't think it was going to go ahead. Um, so I was really pleasantly surprised when they were like, no, no, it's definitely going ahead. Like I thought I just, given every other race has been canceled, it's really impressive that they've managed to pull this off. Um, and they've been so, um, careful about everything and, They've, they've really, really done it really well to keep everyone safe and secure and that. So I hope for their sake as well for London Marathon that it all goes really well and it's, that it's a successful race and event for them. I, I have a couple of questions about um, the race experience itself, right? Like I remember last year in London, I saw you, you were coming over Tower Bridge and like the, the crowd's, I still say to people that London, like that race was the best running event I've been to. The crowds were like 10 deep on both sides and the atmosphere was crazy. This year they've said there's not going to be a single spectator, right? It's, uh, how, how's that, how's that going to feel? It's just, you know, it's you and 30 other women out on the course and that's it. I'm not sure about that. Cause every other marathon I've been in has been, there's been loads of crowds. Uh, well, I guess maybe not Melbourne so much. Um, but there's still lots of people around and I had like a few of the guys pacing me in that. So I didn't feel on my own. Uh, I do remember a stretch in London. It was just gone under this bridge where there was nobody and it was really, really quiet and it was really eerie and you just kind of feel like you're training. And then when you come into the crowd again, you kind of snap back into it and you're like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm in a, a race. I need to, you know, focus. And so it will be a bit strange, I think, having no spectators. Um, but I don't think it's going to bother me that much, to be honest. Like I generally race like head down, eyes on the road, and I'm not really taking much notice of what's going on around me. Like I know in New York, you were saying like that I look straight at you when you were taking photos, and I can't, I can't remember that at all. I can't remember seeing you. If somebody had asked me you were there, I would have been like, no, I don't think so. I didn't see him. Only for I saw all the photos after. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh... It was coming off the Queensboro Bridge, like, you know, on that downhill and then you s sweep left and you just like, I've got the photo of you just eyeballing me. But anyway, um, I've got one more technical question about the race because I know if I don't ask it, people are going to blow up my comments. Um, nutrition, what, what's, your, what's your general kind of, you know, hydration plan for in race? Prior to this, I've usually had the drink mix. Drink mix. Um, and then in New York, I tried a few of the gels. 
Um, so I usually have something every 5k um, and I'll alternate between drink mix and the gels. But this time in London, we actually have the option of having something like every loop. So we could have 19 drinks. So there is the option to take, you know, have a smaller amount more regularly. But I think I'll probably stick to what I'm used to because nutrition can go horribly wrong in a race. So I reckon every two laps or whatever, I'm just going to do what I normally do. I kind of have my nutrition plan down pat now. So I'm just going to stick with that. Now for everybody here in Australia who's going to be watching the race, and I should say it's on at an ideal time for for Australians. It's pretty much, (laughs) I think it's like 4 p.m. Sunday or something like that, which like, so we, yeah, we start life. really early, like 7.15, the women's race starts. Uh, so I think our, like, we will have to get up at 3 a.m. in the morning, um, which will oh. be interesting. <laughs> um, so, so for all the Aussie fans who will be watching and they'll be, they'll be watching yourself and Ali and, and Brett and thinking, is this how they wanted to race? Is this going according to plan? We should be watching and seeing, okay, if Sinead is on sort of PB pace or if Sinead runs a PB, then... It's been a good day. She's going to be happy. Nick's going to be happy. It's uh, it's it's been a successful race. I guess so. Yeah. Um, I mean the the Australian record is kind of looming as well. It's within my grasp. There's like a it's Benita's record is two twenty two thirty six. Um, so if I was having a really good day, I would love to have a crack at that. But I think everything would need to go perfectly to get that. There is a there is a there is talk of a pace there is talk of a pace group in that low two twenties, isn't there? Oh no, well there's a pace group for two eighteen, two nineteen, and then the next pace group is two twenty three, twenty four. So I'm kinda kind of in the middle. Yeah, so I'm gonna have to make a call on the day and I'm just gonna have to see what see how it happens. See what happens. Okay. Um I would be disappointed if I didn't get, you know, a decent PB though. Definitely. Well, I mean it yeah, it's it's a it's an amazing field. It should be a fast course. Um, you know, yeah, let's, uh, let's wait and see. I'm excited to see it. Now, it's, it's probably hard for you to plan out kind of what's, what's happening over summer because you don't know when you'll get home and all those sorts of things and you've got to factor in, obviously, the recovery from a marathon. But have you given much thought to what sort of the summer looks like or the early part of 2021? I would love to race Zadapec if it goes ahead. But that's in December. I don't know if it will go ahead or not. Um, and then beyond that, I haven't really, I haven't really planned any other races. I'll probably do like if races all open up again. Um, you know, I'll have a similar year to last year. Um, I would do, you know, some half marathons, ten k road races. Um, so it would be great if I kind of got the Olympic spots, you know, solidified in this race, so I didn't have to worry about it. Uh, Because I don't want to be chasing um, a spot in, you know, April next year. Um, But, I mean, we'll see what happens. I know that a lot of races that I normally do in Japan have been cancelled. Or not cancelled, but um, they're only going to have Japanese uh, people racing. Um, So, yeah, it's difficult to plan anything without knowing what options there are. How important is that sort of, you know, still keeping up in those 10,000 metre races for your marathon running? Like, does that, is that 10,000 meter speed still helping you when you're running marathons? Yeah, definitely. I think it's important to keep that. Otherwise it's just going to be harder to go the, the pace that you want in a marathon. Um, 10 K is really, 10 K training is really beneficial, I think for marathon training. So when I'm not in marathon training, like, which is very marathon specific, it, like I'm focusing on 10 Ks, half marathons, definitely anything. Um, lower than 10k probably I'm not really going to focus on anymore I think I'm you know happy to leave the 3k and 5k distances um, and yeah focus on the longer stuff we've we've kind of already asked a lot of sort of audience questions throughout this interview but uh speaking of sort of 2021 plans I mean people are asking about whether you have any intention of ever running the Dublin marathon yeah I would definitely love to run Dublin it's yeah, I mean, of course I would. I would. It would be great. But it, it's in usually in October. Um, so I just haven't had a chance uh, over the last few years. But I'll definitely, definitely race Dublin at some stage. And I want to get all the marathon majors ticked off as well. And I'd like wow. to race them. 
not just you know do them i would like to yeah that would be great like i've never done berlin or tokyo and i would love to do those well hopefully we'll get a chance to chat to you after the race as well because it's uh it's going to be a super exciting race it's going to be a unique race i don't think we're well i shouldn't say never but I, i don't think we'll ever really see another kind of looped major like this with no spectators i mean maybe we will but um hey on behalf of everybody thanks so much for being on the show and uh best of luck in london we'll all be watching and uh and we'll all be cheering for you to get a pb thank you very much Ooh, it's exciting to hear Sinead talk about possibly going after the australian record i don't know whether she does it this sunday in london it is going to be a fast race though or whether she tries sometime in 2021 Let's hope that the weather conditions and everything else on the day suits her because it would be massively exciting and reward for effort as well for Sinead. If you guys are looking for the Brett Robinson chat, it's in another video linked to this as part of the playlist or we will have some kind of button up here, I think. Uh, Check that out and thanks so much and uh, we'll see you watching on Sunday. Thanks so much for watching Running Things here on YouTube. If you haven't already, do us a favor, hit that little subscribe button. It really helps out our channel. Also, tell your friends and don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Tempo Journal.